So good morning. I'm really happy to be here um, and to share with you an approach to Parkinson's disease that I think will help you as much as it's helped me and it appears to have helped many others as well. And so while this discussion will focus mainly on those of us with Parkinson's disease, um, I know there are a lot of care partners in the audience as well. And I think that this approach might be valuable for, for you as well. So let's start by posing um, a question that I think we need to consider, the threshold question when anyone is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And that question is, is there a way to organize my brain and my actions to better manage this complex, progressive, degenerative disease in order to maximize my quality of life? So we ask this question against the background of the challenges Parkinson's presents us with, how we respond to those challenges, and the changes that occur as a result of both of these. And so these challenges, responses, and changes are based on the comments and observations of researchers. And they're also ones that I found consistently over the course of the last seven years as I've been leading four uh, support groups for the recently diagnosed, the newly diagnosed. So I submit to you that there are three types of initial challenges that a Parkinson's patient faces. The first set of challenges are usually psychological and they kick in right after diagnosis. We face a lot of these psychological challenges, some of them emotions like fear, <coughs> anger, and shock. And some of them are more complex, like worries about finances and our family and being dependent. And all of these are usually accompanied by anxiety and depression. And we also face increasingly difficult physical challenges, from gait disturbances to freezing to falling. And these physical challenges present us with a certain unpredictability of what every day will bring. We're never sure what it will bring. And stress, as we know, accelerates and exacerbates all of these symptoms. And there's an additional problem with these physical challenges, and that is that they're plain in plain sight for others to see. We can see them, our care partners can see them, and so does everyone else with whom we come in contact. So that's why Parkinson's has been called a public disease. And as a result of these public symptoms, we fear society's response to these symptoms. We fear being stigmatized, ridiculed, isolated, negatively judged. Sometimes we're even thought uh, drunk. No wonder we fear society's reactions. And these societal responses, whether feared or actual, result in a number of negative internal emotions on our part. I'm sure many of you have felt some of these emotions at one time or another. Embarrassment, humiliation, loss of dignity. It's no wonder we feel, feel overwhelmed from time to time. And a result, as a result of all of these, we may experience psychosocial changes as well, perhaps expending a lot of energy trying to hide our disease or withdrawing from social activity because we feel somehow self-conscious or we believe we might be found out, which in turn creates a loss of confidence, personality changes, and, and you feel that you're not quite the same as you used to be. And all of this creates what I call the vicious cycle of Parkinson's disease. It starts with the diagnosis, and as we talked about, there's psychological and physical challenges, which lead to a societal, a potential societal response and our internalized reactions to that societal response and to psychosocial changes. And then as the, degrees, uh, the, the disease progresses, the psychological and physical challenges can become more severe and the societal response and internalized response greater, and the psychosocial changes as well. So we go around and around and around, and this cycle is vicious in another way, and that is that it makes us more difficult to constructively face our Parkinson's disease. 
So how do we break this cycle and how do we organize ourselves to actively and effectively manage our disease? We know that just feeling good about our Parkinson's is not enough. And we know that thinking positively is not enough either. However, we do have one powerful tool available to us to meet the challenges that I've talked about. A psychologically based, scientifically grounded construct called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is, in the world of its be the creator, the belief that one can achieve influence over the conditions that affect one's life. Specifically, self-efficacy is a strength that we can develop that organizes our thoughts and our emotional reactions and our behavioral patterns, and it focuses all of those on the management of our disease. And the theory of self-efficacy was developed in the 1970s by a psychologist named Albert Bandura in Stanford University. And he's often cited as one of the four most eminent psychologists of the 20th century. So let's take a moment now to hear about, hear from two individuals who took part in a Denver-based self-efficacy learning program. They comment on how this program has helped them. Put together a framework to understand. We kind of talk through some of the major aspects of the disease, what the progression looks like, some of the medications, some of the various treatments, both traditional and complementary. And so he just gave it a framework. So it took a lot of the fear out of it and gave me more tools just to be able to think through this and be prepared. So if I saw new symptoms coming, I kind of have a framework to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm aware of that, I knew that was an issue, and know what action to take. That was how. Now we're going to hear from Betsy. Finding the strength within you, be it that everybody has it, but it teaches you how to pull it out, you know, and how to use it. And I, I don't think I'd even be, I wouldn't even be sitting here if I hadn't participated in that. And, um, it's the best thing. So how do we develop stronger self-efficacy? Let's go back for a moment to the science. Dr. Bandura um, developed a four-pronged approach to help us develop uh, greater self-efficacy. But it, it was to develop it within the framework or within the specific area that we wish to apply it. So it's important to understand that self-efficacy isn't universal. It is specific to a certain domain. So that even though we're self-efficacious in one domain, say self-efficacious in golf or self-efficacious in teaching, it doesn't mean that we will be necessarily self-efficacious in managing our Parkinson's disease. So it's those specific behaviors that we're going to be focusing on um, in order to increase our self-efficacious Parkinson's behaviors. So the first method for increasing self-efficacy is developing mastery as an ongoing experience, which is a complicated way of saying to set goals, to pursue them, to achieve them, and to set ever higher goals. Nothing actually is more important to self-efficacy than a mastery experience. So let me show you how this works. So I've developed something called the virtuous cycle of self-efficacy. And it's a way to address the challenges that we spoke about a minute ago, which were the vicious cycle of Parkinson's. So to understand how this cycle works, I'm going to use the example of Judith, who was a participant in our Parkinson's self group, the self-efficacy group. And the first step is to set a positive intention. Corral your thoughts to set a positive intention. And in Judith's case, she decided she wanted to climb a 14er. She hadn't done a lot of hiking before, and she thought that the, this exercise goal would be particularly important for her Parkinson's. So the next thing is the um, attitude or emotion. And she knew it wasn't going to be easy. She knew it would take a lot of hard work, but she was committed to put in the work that was necessary. The next is the action or choice of behavior. And for Judith, she set out a, a number of training heights, each longer and uh, more vertical feet than the last. And then the result is, perform um, is performance improvement when she successfully completed that height. So 
she set out to do a number of these over a period of months. And over three or four months, she actually did achieve what she considered mastery. And she, here she is with her husband at the top of Mount Bierstadt. So Judith actually chose what I would consider a challenging challenge. But you don't really have to choose something that is that um, challenging. Another person in the course chose to be able to write her own checks and sign her checks. So every day, she sat by the TV and used um, a little pad, usually used by a first grader, where she would practice her script within the lines. And so within a number of months, she too was able achieved her mastery, which was to write her checks and sign them as well. The important thing is that you persist, that you set a goal and achieve it. I used to work for Deepak Chopra. And he always used to say that if you pay attention to your intention every day, nothing is impossible. So when you think about that statement, it really is very much about this virtuous cycle of self-efficacy that I just spoke. So you set an intention. Your attitude is attention. Your behavior is every day. And the performance improvement is, in his words, anything is possible. So it's in that way that we develop our self-efficacy belief and our confidence. And so this self-efficacy belief influences many, many things. Our thought processes, our emotional state, our motivation, our patterns of behavior, the challenges we undertake, how much effort we put forth, the perseverance that we exhibit in the face of difficulties. That's why we're able to say that self-efficacy offers us both the procedural process through the mastery cycle that I've just explained and the emotional strength and the discipline to carry out our intentions. So the second way to gain greater self-efficacy is through vicarious learning, through the observation of others, through the observation of positive models, so by seeing others in a similar situation succeed through their own determined efforts, it raises the belief that we too can succeed in the same way. So seeing Judith reach all of her intermediate goals and ultimately climb Mount Beerspot gave me the feeling that I could, if I exercised religiously, develop a state of high physical performance. So it's about observing positive models, which is why support groups are so important, because you can see other people facing the challenges of Parkinson's disease and succeeding. And the third method is through positive reinforcement, which of course is often available in support groups as well. It's really through the feedback and encouragement of others that strengthen our own belief that we can be successful. And we're likely to mobilize greater effort through the encouragement of our peers. And finally, physiological feedback. Signals from our bodies influence the degree of confidence that we feel. So tension, stress, and anxiety tend to diminish our sense of confidence, whereas an elevated mood and a positive frame of mind tend to increase our confidence. So how do all these pieces fit together? Through these interlocking methods of mastery, observing positive models, vicarious learning, um, positive reinforcement, and that physiological feedback our bodies, when our bodies confirm that we're on the right track. All of that works together to enhance our self-efficacy. And with enhanced self-efficacy, we can positively impact our quality of life. Remember in the very beginning when we talked about um, Albert Bandura's definition of self-efficacy, we used the word belief. And when we talked about Judith, we talked about her building the belief and confidence that she could conduct a ever more challenging hike. I'd like to now talk to you a little bit more about that word belief and how belief and action interact. There's a wonderful children's book called The Little Engine That Could that describes the power of belief better than I could. I'm sure many of you remember this. I think I can climb the mountain, said the little boot engine. 
It was a repetitive, it's the repetitive nature of the effort. I think I can, I think I can. And it's important to understand that it wasn't just belief that allowed the little engine to climb the mountain, but it was belief strengthened by her successful achievement of each stage in the climb. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. So progress came in stages, and then she built an ever higher goal. So this simple children's story actually is a parable about self-efficacy. So is there any evidence that self-efficacy can be learned? Here's the result of a self-evaluation survey of 29 self-efficacy behaviors and skills, and that was administered to two groups of patients. In blue are the results from a control group, patients who have not had any self-efficacy training. And in green, the results of one of the groups that made up our self-efficacy program. And the first set of bars is the overall self-efficacy score, so you can see the difference there. And the other three sets of bars are specific self-efficacy behaviors that I just chose as examples. The first is, I know and follow my Parkinson's nutritional guidelines. Second is, I advocate for myself instead of letting others speak for me. And the third is, I understand the precautions and interactions of my medications and supplements. So you can see the difference in the outcome. One was the lowest score, five was the highest score. And the conclusion, while it wasn't a scientific study, nevertheless, it substantiated the notion that by learning self-efficacy behaviors, you can, in fact, manage your disease in a better manner. So let's look at more scientific um, studies on this topic. Dr. Lisa Shulman from the University of Maryland reported to the 2010 World Parkinson's Congress that she conducted a longitudinal study and she analyzed what had the greatest effect on quality of life. She analyzed motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms, demographics, in other words, your age, your gender, your education, et cetera, and your comorbidities comorbid and self-efficacy. And what she found was that self-efficacy was the greatest determinant above all other factors of quality of life. So greater self-efficacy predicted less disease severity and better quality of life, and vice versa. And also the self-efficacy learning forum, the SELF program that I've referred to was a small research study here in Denver supported by the Colorado Neurological Institute Foundation. And I was a co-investigator along with my um, neurologist, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. And the results showed that there was significant improvement in 10 healthcare behaviors and that there was stable emotional functioning, meaning anxiety, depression, and stress, despite the decline in physical functioning. And there were other small studies from Japan and Australia as well. And one of the areas I'm concentrating on right now is trying to get secure funding for a much larger scientific study so that we can really um, show the direct correlation between self-efficacy and quality of life. I'm also trying to find funding to, to train a cadre of leaders so that self-efficacy programs can be delivered in other cities around the U.S. as well. So let's see what Hal and Betsy say about how self-efficacy affects their lives now, several years after the end of the program. I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with much more from a factual basis versus a fear basis. And because I'm actively pursuing and, and improving in a lot of areas, working with physical therapists, working with neurologists, working with clinical trials, I'm taking, I feel like I'm, I'm in the driver's seat and I'm taking control of that. Yes, there's, there's challenges and there's more new challenges, but I feel very empowered to move forward. And let's hear from Betsy. I'll tell you how life-changing, just absolutely life-changing. So in conclusion, patients who acquire self-efficacy skills may be better able to manage the continual challenges of a chronic progressive disease. And self-efficacy may be one of our most important tools for improving quality of life in Parkinson's patients. So finally, what we've done here is take a look at the initial challenges 
faced by Parkinson's patients and then apply to them a theory and a construct that was identified and developed by this man Albert Bandura, to whom we owe so much. And my final comment is actually a quote from Dr. Bandura from a recent email exchange that I had with him, in which he closed by saying exactly what I wish for all of you. May the self-efficacy force be with you. So, in, uh, we have a table out in the um, display area. If you're interested in learning more about self-efficacy, uh, please stop by. We also have cards that you can sign up um, to be notified when the next self-efficacy program uh, will be scheduled. We hope it's early in 2016. Um, there's a booklet on your chairs which kind of highlights the main points of my talk. And if you would like to talk further with either Hal or Betsy, they are sitting in the back of the room and I'm sure they would hang out for a little while after this session and you can ask them a little bit more about their experience. Thank you. <laughs>